Tonight, followed by headliners on TV, radio and online. This is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Good evening, welcome along to Neil Oliver Live on GB News TV and on radio. Tonight I'll speak to the CEO of a child protection charity after the fashion brand Balenciaga was accused of sexualising children in an advertising campaign. The co-founder of the Together campaign will tell us about the fight to get 40,000 care home workers who lost their job for refusing to have Covid jabs reinstated. And in a few minutes, I'll talk about the importance of Christmas and what I view as the relentless erosion of Christianity. All of that and more coming up, but first, an update on the latest news from Ray Addison. Thanks, Neil. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. Parents are being urged to look out for symptoms of Strep A after six children under the age of 10 died from the infection. Symptoms are usually mild, but the UK Health Security Agency is now investigating a rise in severe cases. Experts say a lack of mixing during the COVID-19 pandemic could be behind a drop in immunity. Hugh Pennington, a bacteriologist at the University of Aberdeen, says spotting the symptoms early are key. Because the disease, this severe manifestation of the disease is so relatively rare, many doctors won't have seen a case and they may not have that um, high index of suspicion. The good news is that uh, treatment is straightforward with uh, penicillin. Uh, this is not a bug that's developed antibiotic resistance like so many other bacteria. It's still sensitive to penicillin. The, the whole issue really is can you get the penicillin in there quickly enough? The Russian embassy is demanding to know why a wealthy Russian businessman has been arrested as part of an investigation into oligarchs. The 58-year-old was apprehended at his London home on suspicion of money laundering, conspiracy to defraud the Home Office and conspiracy to commit perjury. Two other men were also arrested in connection with money laundering. All three have since been released on bail. The EU, G7 and Australia have agreed a price cap on Russian oil in an effort to stop Moscow profiteering from the energy crisis. The limit has been set at $60 a barrel. On Friday, Russian crude oil was trading at around $67. However, a senior aide to Ukraine's president says the price should be capped lower at $30 to prevent funding for the invasion. Protests are being held over the fuel poverty crisis in over 40 locations across the UK. Activists unfurled a banner on Westminster Bridge that said, we demand to be warm this winter. 
The protesters say many people now can't afford to heat their homes, whereas energy companies continue to profit. The immigration minister has defended the government's handling of migrants crossing the English Channel after more than 44,000 reached British shores this year. Speaking to GB News, Robert Jenrick said stopping migrant crossings is a priority. He also admitted it could cost the Conservatives at the next election if numbers aren't reduced. Mr Jenrick said UK and French authorities need to work together. The Home Secretary signed uh, a deal just a few weeks ago which is an improvement on the situation, but it isn't the answer. It's certainly not a silver bullet. It does mean that there'll be more French officers on the beaches intercepting boats, but arrests are low and it doesn't seem to break the people smugglers' business. So we're clearly going to have to go much further than that. Some of that will be diplomatic, and Rishi Sunak seems to have built a good rapport with President Macron, but a lot of it's going to be harder edged than that. Police have charged a third teenager with murder after two 16-year-old boys were fatally stabbed in south-east London last weekend. 18-year-old Hussein Barr appeared this morning at Bromley Magistrates Court and was remanded in custody. Two others, aged 16 and 15, were remanded in youth custody yesterday after appearing at Bexley Magistrates. And the TSSA says its members will strike at a further six train operating companies and network rail in a dispute over jobs, pay and conditions. Staff will now walk out on the 17th of December at eight companies, including Avanti West Coast. The union says its members feel they're being treated with contempt and further industrial action over the festive period is being considered. The Department for Transport has urged unions and rail operators to work together to find a resolution. On TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News, the People's Channel. Back now to Neil Oliver Live. For the second year in a row, the Christmas trees are going up early round my way. More and more households that would, in the world of before, have waited until the second or third week in December before decking the halls, have already gone the whole nine yards with the trees and twinkly lights. We're doing likewise in our house. I won't lie, I love it, every bit of it. I love Christmas, always have and always will. In every conceivable way, Christmas is light in a time of darkness. And for many of us, that light has never been more welcome and so can't come soon enough. Especially since the festival is once again under attack by the joyless division. In line with what has become a tradition of the season in benighted Britain, yet another bunch of interfering, patronising preachers of the witless cant of diversity and inclusivity have decided it's their turn to take a pop at Christmas. Bristol-based Watch This Space describing themselves as an inclusion consultancy, heaven help us all, have scored some free publicity by calling on organisations to rethink Christmas on account of how all those of other faiths feel left out in December. I really don't think those of other faiths feel left out at all. I'm certain the vast majority of those of other faiths are perfectly fine with Christians enjoying Christmas, the same way I have no issue whatever with Diwali and Eid and the rest of the religious festivals that genuinely matter to those of faith, and that it is only those that could and deliberately would start a fight in an empty house that want to persuade everyone that Christmas is exclusive and only bad news. For generations, every school in Britain has put on a nativity play. The youngest amongst us are invited to play the parts of Mary and Joseph, the angel, the shepherds, the three wise men. In every school hall is recreated a scene from a village in the Middle East. The people being enacted by children are people of the Middle East. How inclusive and diverse, you might say. It's always Christianity that the nouveau bullies target, in the same way that all bullies have always done, which is to say, single out the one that won't hit you back. The tolerance of Christianity and Christians has been a red rag to a bull, and for years it has been open season on Christmas on the utterly spurious grounds that someone somewhere might be offended by cards, carols and Santa Claus. But hey, it's only Jesus, worshipped by two and a half billion Christians as divine, the Son of God, 
so take up the slings and arrows and do your worst. That latest call to cancel Christmas came hard on the heels of heresy, spiteful childish mewling by a junior research fellow of Trinity College in Cambridge University about Jesus having, and I quote, a trans body. The sticky palmed adolescent piffle was then backed up by the dean of the college, so ensuring more headlines at the expense of followers of the world's largest religion. All of this latest mischief making is just more of the same, which is to say the determination of the empowered elite systematically to remove every last foundation stone of Western civilization, while simultaneously showing us, reminding us who they think is boss. Having excited themselves by stripping away under the egregious wrong of lockdown so much of what it has meant to be human and alive in this part of the world, the usual suspects are determined to keep going until the job is done. Christianity and the family are still standing, and so the attacks must continue. Lockdown was about draining the joy out of life, every last bit. It was about keeping people apart and alone. It was a relentless campaign of fear by authority figures who felt no fear themselves because they knew there was nothing to fear and so broke all their own rules. Now it's about bidding farewell to the very stuff of life, warmth in winter, nourishing food. Stop driving to save the world. Stop flying to save the world. How long before they come for the twinkly lights and crackers as well? The powers that be are about nothing less than making life dull and flat for we proles. The truth is that none of this is to be taken lightly, far less ignored. The relentless erosion of Christmas and Christianity itself is essential for those whose mission it is to unmake Britain and the West. It is nothing less than the deliberate snuffing out of the light of the world. That anyone would ever seek to silence those who want to celebrate Christmas is beyond sinister in my eyes. Because the story at the heart of Christmas is also the story at the heart of humanity and the best of human nature. It's a simple story about a family, indeed the making of a family by the birth of a baby. It's about a baby born into the most humble of circumstances, in a barn for animals, dependent upon the kindness of strangers. Why would anyone good and honest want to take issue with the simplicity of the family and all that the family has meant and continues to mean? Except, of course, that the family is the ultimate obstacle for those intent on resetting the world away from the human and in favour of the machine. Again and again, those who have it in mind to establish centralised, top-down control of populations have targeted the family as the final stumbling block in their path. Always, however, the family has prevailed because the desire for family life is innately human. The way things have been in the West for 2,000 years is a direct and undeniable consequence of the overarching influence of Christianity, our ethics, our morality, the laws by which we live, commitment to the sanctity of the individual, all are founded upon the Christianity of our forebears. In more recent centuries, deluded and dangerous people believed they had the wit and the power to set aside Christian ethics and morality and to replace them with their own ideologies. I invite you to consider the worst horrors of the 20th century and notice how well those experiments went. 150 million dead and counting. What is being inflicted on us now is the death of a thousand cuts. One thing after another, reminding us of who and what we are, where we came from and why, is being debased, devalued, rewritten or erased by others who think they know better. Our heritage, our history, our culture, our society, our communities, our identities as men and women, as sovereign individuals, all of it's being undone, taken away, memory hold. This is deliberate and must be resisted at all costs. Friedrich Nietzsche was among the most articulate to lament the death of God in the West. God is dead and we have killed him, he wrote. Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? And there's the rub. Prophesied by a philosopher 140 years ago, the coming of those ideologues of today who talk of hacking humans, growing babies outside the body of the woman, of mixing humans with technology, who really do believe the time has come for them to assume the power of gods. Worst of all of the anti-human behaviour is the turning upon children, the exploitation of those most vulnerable and deserving of our protection. I don't mean to imply this behaviour is anything new, Rather, it is simply more blatant and shameless. We catch glimpses of the danger. 
most recently in the ad campaign by fashion house Balenciaga that set tiny children in sexual contexts, and we dismiss such threats at our ultimate peril. From drag queen story time to questionable sex education in classrooms, the normalisation of the sexualisation of children is well underway. For those in search of a hill to die on, might not the defence of the innocence of children be the one? The Christmas story is fundamentally about hope. For human beings, there can be no greater gift or reason for hope than the birth of a child. There can be no greater imperative than the urge to protect that child, all children, against all threats. During lockdown, rules were put in place to keep families apart, to separate children from grandparents. They're still pushing their jabs on children. Attempts were even made at that time to cancel Christmas, not that me and mine paid them a blind bit of notice. Faith leaders not worthy of the name complied with diktats that closed churches and so denied needful people access to the comfort and sustenance of holy places when they were most wanted. I keep mentioning the thousands of people who've written to me during the past two, getting on for three years. In the run-up to last Christmas, the emotion of it all was almost overwhelming. My family and I received piles of Christmas cards from families across Britain and around the world. Messages of love, solidarity and determination from people who might otherwise have been strangers to us, but who needed to share Christmas and so shared it with us. The joy of the Christmas message in what might otherwise have been an unremittingly dark time. Over and over we were reassured by all those, the majority of the senders in fact, who like us had identified a fight between good and evil, between light and dark. We were left in no doubt by letter after letter and card after card that the medicine that kept those people well in every way that really mattered was their faith in something bigger than themselves, something transcendent. The central message of Christianity is so simple it can be summed up in a single line. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Has there ever been a more hopeful message? Believe or don't believe, but the Christmas story is undeniably a message of hope and family and love, and about the arrival in the darkness of a bright and warming light. It is worth remembering that the light is always there, even if it is out of sight. I think about the words that, according to the legend at least, were scratched into the wall of a basement by someone hiding from tyranny during World War II. I believe in the sun, even when it is not shining. I believe in love, even when I do not feel it. I believe in God, even when he is silent. In the northern latitudes, people have sought light in the darkness of winter since a time beyond the reach of memory. Millennia before the coming of Christianity, there were fires kindled and lamps kept lit in defiance of the dark and cold. Always the promise held in human hearts that with patience and fortitude, they would see the return of the sun. This year, the dark and the cold are being deliberately intensified by the stated objectives of our so-called leaders. We are told we must have less light, less warmth. We are told these are among the prices we must pay to win a war to save the planet. Now is the time to kindle lights and keep them lit. Nearly 40 years before the birth of Christ, the pagan Roman poet Virgil wrote lines about the birth of a boy, a saviour who would grow up to be divine and save the world. Virgil has been seen by some as a prophet predicting the birth of Jesus. He was sensing the rising of the sun from beyond the horizon. Virgil's poem, written around 38 BC, is a message of hope of the inevitable and imminent coming of light into a darkened world. Here's the thing, we need Christmas and the hope and joy of Christmas, more now than ever. Light whatever lights you can, even the glow of a single candle can be seen for miles. All of that is my opinion, of course, and you're free to disagree. Keep your tweets and emails coming all through the show. You can email gbviews at gbnews.uk and you can tweet me as well at gbnews and I'll try to get to some of your comments later in the show. After the break, I'll introduce my panel and get their thoughts on what I've just said about Christmas in 2022. See you in a couple of minutes. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations. 
for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television and online. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me every Sunday at 6pm for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. With me in the studio until eight o'clock are the filmmaker Kerry Dingle and the political commentator Dominique Samuels. Welcome to you both. Hi. Dominique, thank you for I've, been, me. I've, been, I've been keen to have you as a, as a panelist on here for quite a while, so finally we've made it happen. Well, I'm grateful to be on. Thank and you. Kerry, you're a, a regular. A regular oh, I, it's great to be here. Great to be back. I'll start with you, Kerry. What do you think we need, the, the people of this country need in the run up to Christmas as the, as the nights are getting? longer and darker and colder. I think you said a lot of it, actually, in your uh, monologue. Although I think we do suffer from a profound moral malaise in the West. And I don't know that it's attack on religion so much as a attack on what Christianity has given us, which is a fantastic universalism, a belief in our common humanity, mm -hmm. you know, what we do have in common and can do together. You know, who, who couldn't be for you know, goodwill to all men and peace on earth. And it is around Maybe the world. A... Yeah, exactly. In, is... in Australia, they're on the beach in uh, Santa wears red um, trunks, yeah. apparently. But... And in Japan, even though they're predominantly Buddhist, or the Shinto religion is much bigger than Christianity, they all sing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And, I mean, I, I'm an atheist, but I love Christmas and that message of Christmas, which is, you know... Um, celebrate, eat, drink, be merry, ignore the lean, green, mean, anti-Christmas machine and uh, let's have a great time. Dominique, I feel we're being set against one another. Mm. I, and by that I mean the, the strikes that are happening. Yeah. Now, people have all sorts of views about the inconvenience and, and, and whatever that, that's posed by it, but we're encouraged to fight each other mm. rather than the real source of the problem which yeah. is them above them. We're being divided on race lines, as, as I don't ever remember in my, in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it's, as, it's as though there's a concerted attempt to set us at one another's throats because it keeps us away from the, the main trouble. Oh, I completely agree. And uh, just with specific regard to Christmas, I do think there has been a concerted attack on Christmas, I think, for several years now. Um, one with the lockdowns and, you know, was debating in the past. I mean, I was on Good Morning Britain debating whether or not people should still be allowed to see each other at Christmas. And for me at the time, that felt like such a, a morbid and weird thing to even be debating, to be debating the idea of people of families seeing each other at such mm. a special time of the year. I couldn't believe that was even a question. But there genuinely were people who felt as though Christmas should be cancelled um, because of this pervading fear that was imposed upon the rest of the population. And now 
with, uh, I would say these are emotional manipulative control tactics by claiming that other minorities might be offended by the fact that Christmas is so universally celebrated in a Christian country. Like you said, the fact of the matter is most people who are of different faiths love Christmas, they celebrate it with us. So why then are you trying to plant these seeds of division? Then again, with you know the claims that Jesus would have been trans, it's inserting um, a toxic debate into something that is supposed to be beyond all of that. And, and, and why did they do that? You put, you know, you bang the hammer right on the head. It's to divide and it's to take us away from the true meaning of Christmas, which is togetherness and spirituality and love. Do you think so, Kerry? I, f I feel as if you say you're an atheist, mm. but, but Christmas still is about family. I mean, it's, if, if the Christmas story is about anything, it's about a family get, getting through a difficult time. And, and, and being dependent upon the kindness of strangers. You know? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I think Christmas has come to mean more than um, religion anyway. You know, Chris, Christmas comes from a melange of, you know, Christianity, paganism, all sorts of other celebrations as well, and secularism. So it's quite, and it, it, it's applicable to everybody. So I think you're absolutely right. But I think that point about the humanistic spirit, you know, what we have in common is very powerful, but it's antithetical to the diversity business, you know, the identitarians, people who want to worship difference, who can't countenance all the great things we have in common, that great human spirit, which is what we all get a kick out of with family, friends and strangers at Christmas. <laughs> but one thing on what you said, and may maybe what Dominic was saying, in general, I don't think we are at each other's throats. No, I think we're being set. Well, the they might throat. try, but I, that's where I think they're going to fail. They're absolutely going to fail. We've seen it already. F yes, they might be. There'll be those who say you don't use the, the C word at Christmas. You have to say Xmas or Winterval. There'll be those who say, you know, forgive us our sins for what we've done to the don't forgive us our sins for what we've done to the planet. Look at all the packaging and wasted food at Christmas. Don't turn the lights on. You know, the eco-miserablists. Mm -hmm. We're going to get more of that. But in that sense, I don't mind division because division is a healthy argument and I think people who are coming out, coming out with that stuff are wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I don't mind if we butt up against those who try and cancel Christmas. Um, I think those who do try and uh, would rather kiss Christmas was cancelled will lose. Oh, I love, will, yeah. I love. For, for me, summer is great. You know, and the, the warmth, <laughs> and the sunshine. But I feel a hope around the the lighting of fires and the keeping of lights in the darkness at Christmas time. Yeah. I find that to be the most profoundly hopeful gesture, and it's a human thing that's been going on for hundreds of thousands of years. Fire in the in the against the cold, light against the dark. And that we still enact that, and that you're it's a romantic, of aren't you, Neil? Well, I, no, I agree with you. It is wonderful. Part of Christmas. It is it, absolutely. It is those things, and I, I'd say even though we can't afford the bills, I'm going to do debt this Christmas because I'm going to put the heating back on, you know, for that week. And think, so will a lot of people. Do you think, Dominic, we should just all turn the heating on? and then when the bills come in, we should all just have a ceremonial burning of... I, li I like that idea. I li no, I do like it. And, you know, if it happens, it happens. <laughs> See you in prison. I think, There's I think not that... enough cells. <laughs> <laughs> I think the best way to be defiant isn't to sort of put too much energy into, you know, responding to, to news reports and articles, but to just do whatever the hell you want. Light your Christmas lights, put your heating on, ignore the noise, because the more energy you put into what they're trying to project, I think there's more of a chance of them actually being successful. I would say just bloody ignore them because that's what I'm doing. <laughs> I, I strongly feel that people will do Christmas this year. And it's not about, I know that people are short of money and, and have difficulties they haven't had before, but it will. I think it will remind people about what Christmas actually can be and is, which is togetherness that you know we can afford and we can all share. You know, sharing is a profoundly 
human instinct as well. I think we've we've always done that actually. I don't think it's it's a particularly new thing. I think the sort of charity from on high, you know, is meaningless compared to what most people have done with friends, families, neighbours, local communities for hundreds of years actually. You you know, look after each other. And that's why lockdown was so wrong because in fact we had the experience at a local level of what would be best for our friends and family. We would know better than some, you know, don't hug, only six in a room, you know, all of that rubbish that we had during lockdowns. And I hope there is, this Christmas is part of, after, you know, almost two years ago, really, since Christmas was canceled, we had a bit of a pushback last year. And I hope this winter we do have even more of a pushback. You know, let's make it a hell of a feast and mm -hmm. fun and family and all things great and... And it doesn't have to be about buying lots of plastic and it doesn't have to be about... I don't care if it is. It doesn't have is. to be about waste, but even, if it, but even if you can, even for people that don't have the money to do it, you know, the, the celebration of family... Yeah, and the, and the, being together. And, and, the, <laughs> and the sitting by a fire. <laughs> but also, I think that um, because of all of the debates about, you know, public displays of lights because of the cost of living crisis and also the debates that existed during lockdown, I think it might remind us that in order to celebrate and enjoy, we have in recent years actually placed a lot of reliance on the state to, you know, provide those big Christmas displays, when really it's actually about us as, you know, smaller community providing that Christmas spirit. So that may indeed be a positive. It may remind us that it's us that make Christmas. It's not our local council or government. <laughs> Got to get to a break. Good stuff. Still to come this hour, I'll discuss the controversial advertising campaign from Balenciaga that sexualised children, and I'll meet Alan Miller, who set up the Together campaign in response to the government's COVID measures and now has big plans for the group's future. See you in two. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deeds & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there. From 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the center of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Now, many of us are watching chins on chests, the audacity of those who imposed the lockdowns, now telling us those measures actually hurt more people than they helped. Who knew? Those of us who warned of as much months, if not years ago, have now to endure the likes of Chris Whitty and Patrick Valance, government cheerleaders for the months of isolation, now warning of spiking death rates on account of millions locked down and away from treatment for cancer heart disease and other illnesses. All of this and more besides is proof, if any proof were needed, that it's surely up to us, the people of this country, to come together for each other and find better ways to reclaim our lives and our country. 
My next guest is Alan Miller from the Together campaign, who is especially fired up about the need to take back democracy. Alan, welcome. Thanks for having me, Neil. How do we get ourselves out of this mess that is of others' making? I think it's really important, uh, uh, and the viewers will know this, to say that uh, the thing that keeps people honest in uh, politics is the public. It's always been the case that ordinary people have, in the, in the modern period have shaped the world and that any important changes have come from them. And we've had a series of decades now where there's been this technocratic impulse, where this, when in doubt, regulate, uh, ever separation between those that are elected and the public. And we saw that uh, coalesce on steroids during uh, the imposition of lockdowns, this whole idea that we're vectors, we're terrible. When all, lots of people originally, if we remind ourselves, wanted to volunteer, that was snuffed out. We were told to go and sit in the corner, hands on heads. We now see even more technocratic impulses, whether it's the IMF or, or whether it's our own leaders that are saying, these are the measures that are going to have to happen to you now. We haven't got big solutions. I think we need a massive national debate where ordinary people are at the heart of it, where the public is at the heart of it. And that's why uh, the Together Association has got local, regional and national um, groups of people coming involved. We've got over 300,000 signatories. And we are launching a shadow cabinet. We're going to be launching a shadow cabinet that says there's a range of people in different areas that is going to be constantly critical in the different areas that are going on. But with a view that, actually, the public has always got very good instincts and we need to be at the heart of things, whether it's what's happening with the NHS, whether it's to do with wealth creation for everyone, productivity, whether it's to do with the kind of... Um, regulations in society, the fact that we don't want compulsory ID, the fact that we should be able to speak freely. You know, we've just seen the online safety bill after three years of having people taken down and censored and Elon Musk now coming out uh, to, to, to stop that a bit, but we shouldn't rely on one person at all ever, to have free speech and to say that we're not these mad, out-of-control people. Actually, we're the neighbours, friends, colleagues, staff, family that make Britain so brilliant. And actually, it's the public uh, that really need to be at the heart of matters. And we need to show the technocrats, and that, that's the government, largely, and the so-called opposition, who actually wanted more, longer, harder restrictions. And so we'd invite everyone that's watching, uh, if they want to be involved locally, regionally, and nationally, to get involved with the Together uh, Association, togetherdeclaration.org. We want people around the country. We want people to actually be vocal, like we've been doing in our campaigns. We've been getting people to uh, lobby their MPs, uh, to, to post, to go out and leaflet and talk to citizens, to talk to their colleagues. We have shown, when people think it's... You know, sometimes people can be fatalistic, like everything is out of control, there's nothing we can do. We demonstrated with many different people, but with Together, that actually around the vaccine passports and specifically the vaccine mandates, we could stop it when we worked together. I don't think enough people realise that that happened. <laughs> you know, because, because it happened, I think too many people thought it was just, I don't know, just happened organically and naturally. Right. But where, where those mandates and vaccine passports came in in other parts of Europe and the world, it didn't happen here. That's right. And that was because of people being people. Absolutely. Speaking up. It was to do with brave frontline workers, uh, uh, NHS staff and others that said, we've been here working for a year. Why is it that we're now having this imposed on us? They put themselves on the line. It was to do, to do with lots of different campaigns and organisations, people like NHS 100K, um, together work with lots of different people. It was to do with ordinary people saying, actually, it's unacceptable, coming out on protests and demonstrations and bringing that to their local MPs, to their councillors and also to the government and fighting back. And you're absolutely right now. We were told by friends in Canada and Australia, you'll never stop the mandate. Right, but actually, we need to take a win when it's there mm. and say, this is what we're capable of, right? And we are, we are agents, we are potentially curators of the future. You know, we're the best of British and we've got to believe in ourselves. And actually, you know, without sounding corny, we want to be the change of the future. We want to see the change. It's going to be up to us, right? We can either be on the sidelines, which is where many technocrats want us, nudging, fear, telling us it's the next catastrophe, or us rationally arguing and imposing ourselves uh, on the world in the way we want to see it. Kerry, how do you feel? I'm, I'm watching both of you nodding mm. gently well, along. What do you well, I, I like a lot of what Alan... Taking is... agency. You know, yeah, the, no, I, I think the majority agency's the at the heart of things. But I, I, 
I, I have to put a butt in here. I like a lot of what Alan says, and I think the Together campaign's been great and very important in terms of overturning things like the vaccine passports. But my only worry is as follows. Young people that I teach film to say to me, you know, I want my voice, yeah? And I always say to them, but what do you want to say? Now, I just want to be... I, I, I know Alan doesn't think like this anyway, but I think we should be careful not to obsess on the process, how you're involved, what you're involved in, is it a shadow cabinet? What, what is it? And But to think about and clarify, and it, yes, in some regards, as I was saying earlier, that might mean more division, because it's more rouse. What do you want to say? Because otherwise you can have a wonderful public platform and petitions and everything else, and it's simply echoing the mainstream. But, but we do need to coalesce, though, don't we? I mean, I think what Alan's saying is that we need to come together, uh, so as well as people independently... About what? how to fix this, you know, we, and a shadow that's cabinet or point. whatever. That, but that's not just talk. That's a, that is a practical taking of agency and saying, you know, we are an alternative. I think, I think also, Neil, it's, it's important what Kerry's saying, and I think it's important. That's why we hold public events around the country. It's why we constantly do streams where we have debates and discussions, like on the Human Rights Act, for instance. Many people around us that are anti-lockdown will say, we must save this. But actually, where, were, where was it in the last two and a half years, the Human Rights Act? <laughs> and where were the human rights lawyers? But we thrashed that debate out. Some people were saying there was a fear about discussing the Great Reset, so we got a big event on uh, nationally with lots of different people talking about that. Is it inevitable? What does it mean? Where are the big questions of technocracy? Is it really Davos or is it closer to home? And, you know, we got, let's be honest, one of the things a politician should have said from day one is we don't have all the answers. Be honest, right? But it's through the process of engaging and discussing things you get clarification. I would say, though, we've got some pillars. And our pillars are very boring and ordinary, actually, but they're really radical today, which should be exciting to people, because they're based on... <laughs> who think we'd be having this conversation now? Democracy, rights, freedom of speech, freedom of congregation, privacy a distinction between the public sphere and the private sphere, that we're not all mad, bad and dangerous, that, you know, that we are... And, and democracy, freedom and rights, and to the point about young people, some young people have been brought up to think that it's... It, you should, free speech is problematic because I don't want to upset people and offend them. Now, we can't just say free speech, free speech. This is to the point. We have to engage and win hearts and minds and explain why being upset and offended and sometimes really furious is actually an important thing and, and something that must happen in a free society because the alternative is none of us ever get to speak about anything, which is where some of the direction is going at the moment, and we've seen much of that. So I'm in agreement with Kerry, actually. I think we do need to thrash these things out. We, uh, together, have uh, a few key pillars that are around the ways that we organise, and putting the public at the heart of it and take back democracy is, is the key thing. But the pillars are freedom, rights, privacy, choice and autonomy. Dominic, how do you respond? How do you feel about that? Because I, I wonder if, as, as Alan says, the uh, uh, younger generations, I don't know, under 40, under 30, whatever, are less inclined maybe to speak for fear of offending. Mm. You know, that a lot of that brainwashing or indoctrination has taken root. And yeah. it has meant that pe I think people, younger people perhaps would have an instinct to look to the state or look to others for the, for the instructions about the right way to behave and the right way to speak. Yeah, I think that is the real issue. It's how, how we're actually going to be able to counter that because it's coming in all directions. It's coming in the films that we consume, in the advertisements that we consume, even the food we consume. It's in our education system, our universities, our schools, even our primary schools at this point, the conditioning, the brainwashing, mm. uh, to create the idea that having free speech is bad because you might offend someone, despite the fact that that's the very essence of free speech. In order to speak freely, there will always be the possibility that you offend someone. But just in regards uh, to what Alan is doing, I have no criticisms whatsoever. It's OK to, you know, sit from the sidelines pointing, saying what you're doing isn't good enough, but it's, you know, the fact that people actually have the bravery and the initiative to actually try and do something that's amazing, yes. because it's things like that that, you know, it may not seem major in the, you know, in the small scheme of things, but in the grand scheme of things, they make a, a massive it's difference. It's also... It's to hear the fire in your voice when yeah. a lot of people sound extinguished by, you know, two, three years of relentless 
exactly. propagandising. To, uh, to get to something specific uh, that you're about, what about the, the 40,000 care home workers? Yeah. You know, you've been very proactive about that. Yes, so for over 40,000 care workers, as you say, they were actually, we've lost them because unlike stopping the mandate for the NHS, that... We, we, we weren't formed then and we didn't get there fast enough and mm -hmm. they were lost. We've got 165,000 uh, gap in staff. We've got over 13,000 beds being blocked, not releasing people. The, everyone is talking about the Care and Quality Commission's report about how significant care is in the context of the NHS, but almost nobody is talking about the vaccine mandate and the consequences of that. So our campaign, it's very simple, Apologise, compensate and reinstate the care workers. We've now got uh, over 80,000 signatures on it. We are talking to various MPs and Lords and others as well, like we did with the petitions for the vaccine passports mm. and mandates. And we're going to continue arguing this case. We've lost people that have got decades of experience who, again, were on the front line. And I just must say that in the last couple of days, the news, with... I, I find it difficult saying his name now, but with Matt Hancock blaming the staff and some care, you know, care, care homes for the issues that we've seen. It just goes to show how contemptuous it is. It's like blame, blame ordinary people, blame workers, blame the staff. No one takes responsibility and it's just not good enough. How can anyone be arguing against uh, the reinstatement and the compensation of those? I mean, surely the facts have now dictated that what they did was completely right, mm. that, their, that their stance was only ever a human stance to which they were entitled. Well, you know, the question... So there's always a question of choice, and whoever was right or wrong, it was about their own personal choices. What was certainly wrong was to try and force someone to do something against their will. It, now we see as well, but this isn't the main point, we now see that it does not stop transmission, but that's not the point, because if it did, the principle of choice is still there. And what had happened was, uh, this was a year down the line, Right, you know, this was some time down the road that, that this had all happened to people. So, the, the key question is, um, you know, about the reinstatement conversation. People will say various things; they'll, they'll, they'll make objections. Uh, but the point is this: our goal is to get out wider and to more of the public to have these conversations with them, like we want to about lockdowns. It's astonishing that when we're talking about the cost of living, cost of lockdown crisis, which has other things that have led up to it as well. We've had a sluggish economy for three decades, if we're honest, but the last three years has meant that now it's all come to a head. And the impact of that, and a lot of people are not associating that, and people are getting let off the hook. And I think we really need to be able to win over other people in the public, that's one of our key things, and also have them involved in saying what they want to see happen, right? Because at the moment, all the conversations and discussions are the market say. Yeah. The Bank yeah. of England. Mm. I mean, like, well, actually, what I don't, do what, who say? are the markets, right? Mm. It's us, it's our friends, neighbours, loved ones. It's, it's like, what do we want to see happen in Britain? And one thing I say about this, Neil, is that when we shine a light here and we do things here, look how quickly they change elsewhere. This is a historic moment for us all, right? And without trying to sound too grandiose, if not now, when, right? We have a, a situation where we've allowed people that are technocratic and, and really quite contemptuous. I, I, unbelievably, actually, if you think about what happened with Brexit, right, where you had this whole, you know, a lot of people came out and got engaged in the public and everything, but you leave it in their hands, any of this stuff, and they've demonstrated what they do, and now they're coming out with mealy mouth, half apologies and mere culpas for things that have happened. It's just unacceptable, and no-one wants to live in the past, but it's important to remember what has happened and not to get flannelled and to say, what do we want moving forwards? What do we want our education to look like? What do we want care to look like? How do we want the workplace to be? You know, we're not going to fight amongst each other. You tell us it's, you know, they're the ones to blame because they're deciding to, to fight for their livelihoods. Actually, we've all got a lot of common interests here, right? We don't want to get divided over what people say, what people look like and that kind of thing. We've got common interests and they're based around us 
uh, citizens and what our needs are. Common interests. Alan, it's brilliant. It's inspirational. I want to give you a little you. present as well. This is the battle of... Uh, the, the three three epic battles uh, that saved democracy. Just to say, that was 2,500 years ago. We stand on the shoulders of many over the last few hundred years. And thank you for your contributions, Brilliant, Neil. Alan. I'm just going to have to move it to the yeah. break, though, sadly, after yeah. which I'll discuss the controversial ad campaign that led to a major fashion brand being accused of sexualising children. Back in two... Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Fashion house Balenciaga were backed into an apology last week after the latest ad campaign featuring children holding teddy bears dressed in bondage gear. No sooner had the gimp bears uh, in the hands of minors gone viral, but a second campaign in collaboration with Adidas featuring a bag placed on top of legal papers concerned with child pornography. After days of silence, brand ambassador and style arbiter for millions, Kim Kardashian finally said she was re-evaluating her relationship with Balenciaga. Joining me now to consider the repercussions of all this ugliness is Nikki Holmes, CEO of child protection charity Safer Together. Good evening, Nikki. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Oh, no, thank you for making the time. Nikki, is this a glimpse, would you say, of a broader trend in society towards normalising the sexualisation of children? It absolutely is. And I think a really important uh, thing to consider is that we're not just talking about Balenciaga. We're talking about a whole range of uh, organisations uh, that use children and sexualisation of children in their advertising. And um, it, it causes significant harms to children. I've seen uh, over recent days people being really confused about what underpins the backlash regarding the Balenciaga campaign because as far as at least I'm aware, no direct harm was caused to the child models that were used as part of the um, campaign. But again, I think that's a really narrow view, a really short-sighted view, and that we need to be aware of the wider societal harms that are caused by campaigns such as this. What possesses, I ask, what possesses a world-famous brand or, or any brand to act in this way? I think it's difficult to say. I mean, I think that, you know, there, there is that notion of sex cells, but we're not just talking about the sexualisation of children here. I think what's particularly shocking about this campaign is that actually it's very overt in the linking of childhood and themes related to child sexual abuse. Um, so, you know, I think the fact that this campaign has been uh, branded by some as being edgy, 
being you know dark symbolism it gets people talking and unfortunately um you know that that's that's why i think many organizations and and brands uh do sexualize children but i think there's also an element of the normalization of the sexualization of children we're almost desensitized to it because it is so prevalent and so pervasive Kerry, what do you think? What, I mean, what, I, what goes just... on here in the minds? Because they, we were invited to imagine to begin with that it was kind of a mistake. Yeah, no, Those that's campaigns nonsense. are poured over these, these, They, sp they, they spend out. hours picking what image or photograph, and you know they're exactly all in on it. What they were going to do. And it's uh, this paedophile chic phenomena, and it, unfortunately, I do think your guest is right. It is widespread, not just within advertising. You know, we've seen the drag queen storytelling, you know, and all sorts of things, which just... What on earth are these people thinking that this is OK? You know, we have the ludicrous DBS checks so that, you know, everybody, you know, a lorry driver who helps a kid up, or if I hugged a kid in a supermarket that was crying... Questions with Horror, parents. horror, and you, you don't. You know, you see a little kid and you leave them because you think people will get it wrong, yet these people get away with doing this perverse horror show and think that's OK for their branding and marketing. I thought it was very just disgusting. That Kim Kardashian, I mean, to, you know, to, to name one of the names, yeah. that she took days, you know, there ought to surely not instant. be an instantaneous get me as far away from that, mm. from that organisation, from that corporation as you can possibly get me, rather than appearing to wait for a few days to see which way the wind was blowing. Well, the reason why, sadly, is because this sort of thing is... Uh, more or less accepted in Hollywood, and that's why many celebrities that have worked with the brand haven't spoken out because they prioritise, you know, their income, their connections, than they do prioritise the protection of children. And I think Balenciaga's response to this has been really laughable. Um, they've tried to deny culpability with specific regard to the bag with reference to the child pornography case. They've now dropped the $25 million lawsuit um, against the production company Group 6, which says to me everything that we need to know. I even have a quote here uh, from Demna in 2016. Uh, he said, someone wrote that Lotta and I, who was Balenciaga's main stylist in uh, 2018, Gotha, um, we grew up on child pornography and radiation from Chernobyl, and that's why we're so effed up. Um, so this sort of stuff dates back to 2016, and even then, no one thought to actually question what Demna had actually said. And for those that don't know, uh, Demna is the creative director of Balenciaga. Nikki, I'm also aware, obviously, of this this uh, uh, acronym now that's out there, MAP, uh, Minor Attracted Persons. So that you know, beyond the realms of fashion and advertising. You know, there's also a movement out there to suggest that being attracted, sexually attracted to children is just part of the, the spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's a really harmful narrative that we just cannot afford to buy into. And I think that the reason why we are so concerned about the sexualisation and the commercialisation of children in campaigns such as this is that I think it you know, effectively makes it much easier for those that seek to abuse and exploit children uh, to abuse and exploit, because what we see with campaigns that sexualise children is that they objectify children. It means that we don't see the innocence of childhood, but actually we see children as objects. And for those that, as I say, do seek to exploit and abuse, I think it makes the whole process of abuse and exploitation much easier. What should we be doing? You know, what, what, as, a, as, a, as a society, as, as ordinary parents of kids, what do we do? when we feel that we're swimming in this kind of cesspit? It's really difficult. And there was the, um, the Bailey Report, the Bailey Review uh, from 2011, which kind of highlighted how many parents and carers feel really out of control because of this constant bombardment of advertising which uh, objectifies and sexualises children and that they feel pushed into a corner in the sense that they have to talk about really difficult topics in a, you know, a time when they're not maybe ready to, or maybe the child is not actually ready to navigate these themes and topics as well. But I think that on the flip side of that, that actually talking about this campaign, being really cognizant of them means that we are aware of them and aware of their harms. So actually, I think that the positive of a campaign like this is that it prompts conversation. And actually, Nikki, I'm going to have to. I'm just going to have to cut you there for just for shortage of time. Thank you so much for this evening. Thanks for uh, casting a light on what is a very dark subject.
Time for a break, but there's lots more on the way after seven o'clock. See you shortly. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live on TV, online and on GB News Radio. In the next hour, I'll meet this week's Great Britain, a woman who was awarded the MBE for her services to her community. I'll speak to the Kent farmer who's branching out by selling Christmas trees to make ends meet. See what I did there? And in a few minutes, I'll talk about how to stay healthy in winter, how the cost of living crisis is affecting people's mental health. And that's after the news headline brought to you this evening by Ray Addison. Thanks, Neil. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. Parents are being urged to look out for symptoms of Strep A after six children under the age of 10 died from the infection. Symptoms are usually mild, but the UK Health Security Agency is now investigating a rise in severe cases. Experts say a lack of mixing during the COVID-19 pandemic could be behind a drop in immunity. The Russian embassy is demanding to know why a wealthy Russian businessman has been arrested as part of an investigation into oligarchs. The 58-year-old was apprehended at his London home on suspicion of money laundering, conspiracy to defraud the Home Office and conspiracy to commit perjury. Two other men were also arrested in connection with money laundering. All three have since been released on bail. The EU, G7 and Australia have agreed a price cap on Russian oil in an effort to stop Moscow profiting from the energy crisis. The limit has been set at $60 a barrel. On Friday, Russian crude oil was trading at around $67. However, Ukraine's President Zelensky says the price cap will do little to deter Russia from continuing its invasion. Protests are being held over the fuel poverty crisis in over 40 locations across the United Kingdom. Activists unfurled a banner on Westminster Bridge that said, we demand to be warm this winter. The protesters say many people now can't afford to heat their homes, whereas energy companies continue to profit. 
The TSSA says its members will strike at a further six train operating companies and network rail in a dispute over jobs, pay and conditions. Staff will now walk out on the 17th of December at eight companies, including Avanti West Coast. The union says its members feel they're being treated with contempt and they're considering further industrial action over the festive period. The Department for Transport is urging unions and rail operators to work together and find a resolution. England will face the winners of the Africa Cup of Nations tomorrow in their first match in the knockout stage of the World Cup. Senegal won their title only seven weeks ago. They were runners-up in their group as well. However, the three Lions are favourites to go through to the next round. Well, ahead of that game, England captain Harry Kane has sent his best wishes from himself and his squad to former footballer Pele. The 82-year-old, who's currently battling colon cancer, was recently admitted to palliative care. Kane says he cherishes advice he received from the football legend, who he describes as an inspiration. We're on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. This is The People's Channel, GB News. Back now to Neil Oliver Live. Thanks, Ray. If there's a theme for tonight's show, I hope it's about looking to the future and reclaiming control over our lives. I, for one, feel the state has let us down, to put it mildly. Rather than only focusing on what's wrong, though, we surely need to get active instead of just waiting to be told what to do. With that in mind, my next guest is Dr Tess Laurie, speaking on behalf of the World Council for Health. Good evening, Tess. Great to see you, as always. Good evening, Neil. Thank you very much for inviting me to have a chat. No, it's great. First of all, why is it important for the UK public, the people of this country, to take back control of their own health? Well, Neil, I don't think it's any secret that, you know, the state of public health really is at an all-time low. We've had unprecedented, we have an unprecedented rates of, of chronic illness um, and disease, like heart disease, cancers, diabetes, um, uh, autoimmune diseases, and not to mention anxiety and depression, um, and sudden deaths, you know. So we have um, many, a huge proportion of the population taking drugs for one thing or another, including young people, and, uh, you know, really at unprecedented levels. And not to mention, you know, on top of all of this, we have an MHRA that hasn't done its biannual safety audit. Um, so um, there's no time like now to take control and responsibility for our health. In, in practical terms, though, you know, given that your people traditionally would go to the would go and seek health advice out, out with the home. What, in practical terms, would you recommend that people actually do when you talk about taking control themselves? Well, we have to stop outsourcing our health decision-making to others, you know, for starters, um, and, and learning about what um, being healthy means, remembering what being healthy means too. Health doesn't come in a pill. Uh, it's a daily practice and we need to take heed of everything we put into our bodies, from the food we eat, what we drink, what we think, and, and, um, and everything else, and ask, is this good for me? And then, of course, diet is the very first thing. You know, it's, it's the absolute foundation stone. What are we eating? Are we eating enough fruit and vegetables? Organic, ideally, and I know organic is more expensive, but uh, it is far healthier for us. Um, we'd like to see people eating far less sugar and carbohydrates, sweet foods. Um, and coffee, too. You know, we, we drink enormous amounts of coffee, and that's a stimulant, and it causes anxiety and, and can actually you know, make us feel unwell during the day in excess. Um, we need to spend more time in nature, um, get good sleep, and have, have quality family time and time alone with ourselves, with, with, without gadgets, um, without screens, uh, you know, reading a book or, or being in nature, going for a walk. Um, and, and we need to wean ourselves off our addictions like sugar, or, uh, alcohol in excess, and, 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 and these cell phones and apps that keep us constantly sort of in a loop. Um, and I think most importantly, you know, we need to start giving back. Um, our lives 
are hugely enriched when they have meaning and purpose. And so, you know, I recommend to people that they go and find their purpose, uh, explore their, find ways of helping in their communities. And there's so many wonderful community initiatives in the UK that have started up over this COVID period. Um, and, uh, you know, go and find something in your neighbourhood um, and find a way in which you can contribute. Bear with me, Tess, while I, I, I turn now to my, to my panel as well. Dominique, I felt you nodding uh, yeah. your assent there. What was particularly on your wavelength there? Well, what she was saying really re resonated with me because um, I can't say too much about it, but I've just come back from a, a, a retreat and um, it, was a, it was a very spiritual retreat. And one of the main things that they, they, they said was we should really pay attention to how we treat ourselves, that being what we put inside of our bodies, how we think about ourselves and how we think about the environment around us. And one thing that's really interesting, and this has been proven in numerous experiments, um, how we think about ourselves, if we're continually anxious, continually negative, that actually does have an impact on our health because our cells feel in, in, in layman terms, sad, which can actually provoke things like migraines, like headaches, like digestive issues. So finding that purpose and being kind to ourselves is one of the main ways that we can lead more happy and healthy lives. Unfortunately, at the moment, I would say there is a concerted effort to stop that. I think that the media, uh, you know, global organisations, you know this, they, they're trying to invoke anxiety, trying to invoke fear. And what that actually does is it makes you sicker because um, it's, it, your cells feel sad, they feel anxious and, and it creates problems. Kerry, what do you think about the toll? <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure which way you're going to go here. No, the, I... toll, the, the toll taken on us, though, by the stress <laughs> of the last couple of years. Oh, no, I think th that's real. Uh, that, that's real, although people get slightly carried away saying... <clears throat> You know, they've been shut in too long and therefore they're mentally ill. There's kids in prison who haven't got a mental illness. Uh, so things get, you know, uh, exaggerated, although the fear and the problem's real. But actually, Dr Laurie is doing the government a service. We've had years of this, eat for a day, panic on a plate about our food. You know, at a time when you can't get an appointment, you can't get the hospital care you need, you know... Having a nice diet and it's not going to give you heart surgery or save the friend of mine who died this year from cancer or the friend of mine who came back and couldn't get into hospital uh, last year who died without her husband by her side, um, who they couldn't even diagnose. You know, let's get real. This is a way of really playing into the hands of those who have you know, given us a really rubbish health service at the moment, saying it's your responsibility, it's what you eat, go out more. And it's it, it Christmas. Is what, it is what you eat, though. Well, it isn't what you eat. It is. You know, there are lots of things that we've eaten for hundreds of years that have not caused us to be... What's to die. No, you know, in truth, we have a rubbish health service. The we chemicals. have people living longer and older and more fruitful lives than ever in history. We know what's good to eat. It's Christmas. I don't want to go to the doctors with a cut finger and get what I, I got last year. How much do you drink? But you're not, I've got a cut finger. But you're not, How much do you drink? not acknowledging that it's a fact that chemicals that have been put in our food, whether it be seed oils, whether it be uh, you know, so why are people living to a hundred now? But we're living, but we're living in great lives. All the, the rates that people are living longer, uh, it fluctuates all around the world. But if you've noticed, people are living longer, but they're obviously they're suffering with more health issues. And what is put in our food has a, a great impact. And these things weren't put in our food hundreds of years ago. T Tess, <laughs> Tess, obviously you've you've sparked you've sparked debate uh, here <laughs> in this in this studio. How do you respond to that? You know, on the one hand, Kerry is saying you know, that, that you're encouraging people to not make demands upon a health service that we pay for and that ought to be there. Dominique is, is, is more in accord with you that we've been, you know, that we've been nudged into unhealthy ways. How do you, how do you reconcile those two different strenuously expressed points of view? Well, I think we have a very disease-centric health system and approach to health. So we all wait until we get a disease and then we go and get some... Uh, some health care for that. And so we miss a huge opportunity to prevent the disease. And we need to change the way we look at disease and health. And take if we take responsibility for our health and we live in a healthy way, 
um, treating ourselves well. It doesn't mean you can't enjoy Christmas, um, but you know, just um, it's just a totally different approach, uh, and and it's and it's it's about quality of life, uh, so that we can live as long as possible with the best possible health, rather than having a, an increasingly um, worsening health, uh, getting a disease because one hasn't taken uh, good care of oneself, and then um, and then having to go on drugs for the rest of your life with with increasing poor health until one dies, even if it is uh, at a hundred. I'd rather live till a hundred and have a really good, uh, a healthy life, and then lie down and 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 pass on then then have the last 50 years of my life having a whole lot of drugs and um, you, you know and i think um we we need to to really um uh, reduce our dependence on pharmaceutical drugs and interventions and um and uh, and surgery and all sorts of things we need to reduce our dependence on these things and rather um uh, and live in, a, in, in, in healthier ways, um, not, not least because the NHS can't cope, but simply because it's, it's, it's no, um, lead, leads to a much, um, uh, you know, a much greater sense of well-being. But Kerry, isn't there, isn't there uh, right thinking there that we, we have been nudged into unhealthy ways of living? You know, there, there's, there's burgeoning evidence about, as Dominique says, you know, the, the oils that we cook our food in, you know, years ago, we were nudged to a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet that's, you know, that, that has proven to be counterproductive. And yet, we are, and we, we are dependent upon and look to a health service to fix us when we make ourselves ill a lot of the time, isn't there? There is something in that about there, there being a responsibility on us to, to be healthier, which is in our grasp. But, you know, I, 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 maybe we're, we're t you're talking to a whole different set of people, Neil, than I am, but young people, Gen Z, you know, and the millennials, for example, are obsessed with their health. They are narcissistically, bodily obsessed. And no, that's why... No, hang ways. on, let me finish, in Dominique. Veganism is huge. A plant-based diet is huge. I don't know who Dr Laurie is talking to. The idea that there's this, you know, fat, older generation that's responsible for the... You know, you can imagine it even happening where they say, you can't get health health care because you're you've made yourself a beast we're already seeing that an attempt to deny smokers access to health care well what if i want to go mountain climbing and have an accident i want a health system i'm sorry but we have an advanced health care possibilities and i'm afraid this interference in what we eat drink and how we run our lives I find antithetical to anyone who likes liberty and freedom and to a belief that we don't have common sense. We've right... got it all. You can Google any disease and but symptoms is it, you is like it, is now. It right to do what you like and expect a health service in whatever form to fix it for you? Or shouldn't you no, take that isn't responsibility? The, it's not, that's not the point, though. I think you've... It's not you, Dominic's you, point. You've viewed, you viewed it more as an attack on those who become ill and expect treatment. I don't think that was her point at all. Her point was that there are methods that we can use to prevent those diseases developing in the first place. And pharmaceutical industries and, and even the NHS and even the GPs that we go to, much of the time they're treating the symptoms of a disease and not the actual cause. Well, actually, they're example, more obsessed example, with prevention than ever before. Yeah, I mean, That's no, like my example, example. For example, with the, you know, the mass use of things um, like antidepressants, despite the fact there are studies uh, coming out that are saying that um, SSRIs aren't actually helpful because the problem isn't actually a lack of serotonin that causes depression. So it's this dependent on things like the NHS when there are things that we can well, do GPs. to prevent people being ill Tess, in the first place. Tess, you can see that this, that, that this invokes <laughs> passionate debate. How do you pour oil in these troubled waters? Well, if, if I think, if I could just say, you know, what, if one looks at the food that's available in the supermarkets, there's a lot of very, it's all very long life. And um, as, your, as one of your guests pointed out, um, there's, you know, there's a, there are a lot of... Um, chemicals that are added to our foods and so uh, and um, lots of pesticides added to our um, our um, 
uh, vegetables and, and fruits. So it really is, um, a, 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 there's, a, there's a whole lot of um, other things that are added and, 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 and processing that goes on in the food that's available and that's kind of sold to us as, um, as healthy. So, you know, we're really encouraging people to, to look at what they eat and eat and eat, eat whole foods, eat things you can identify um, and, um, and uh, you know, and prepare at home rather than have food that's prepared out um, or in a factory somewhere uh, and you don't really know what's gone into it. Yeah, yeah. It is, a, it, is a, it, is, it is something that I think polarises people. I think there is the, there's the two attitudes out there, one that you should be able to eat what you like and do what you like and that medical science is there to pick up the pieces or a holistic approach that suggests that if you live differently that you can, that you can as you say, take some responsibility for preventing the, the decline. Yes, in and, and actually the, the wonderful thing is that everybody has a choice, you know, so, um, so one can choose. And, and I think this is really for people who are not feeling that well. If you're feeling absolutely well, then there's no reason to change. But everybody has a choice. And if you're not feeling well and you're not in optimal health, well, there are things you can do. And, and uh, the, the best place to start is looking at your diet and asking, are these things that I'm eating? Because, you know, that is the fuel that's going in, that's going to be driving your activities and your energy levels uh, for the day and, and your general sense of well-being. So, you know, that's a really good place to start, um, is, is looking at your diet and, and the, the whatever medicines you're on and the drugs you're taking um, and the activities you're doing, the people you're hanging out with, the, the, the media you're consuming, because if you watch a lot of really negative media, you know, uh, murder and mayhem all the time, well, that's going to yes. take a toll on your Tess, Laurie, mental health. Tess, we've just run out of time again. It's a fascinating debate. It's a fascinating subject, and it's been a pleasure talking to you once again. Thank you. After the break, Thank I'll you. be joined by a farmer who's transforming his land to support wildlife. See you in three minutes this time. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. So I'm it's completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune-in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm 
where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News headliners at 11 p.m. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Welcome back to GB News. Backward turn backward, oh time in thy flight, make me a child again just for tonight. A Kent farmer is hoping to turn back time on his land so as to encourage the return of the wildlife he saw there in his youth. Alex Bates, who farms in Rochester, is working with the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds and others to restore the fortunes of 80 hectares of wetland. Good evening, Alex. Good evening, sir. Good. You walked into a very angry room. <laughs> you, will now, you will now, you will now, no, reset, the, you will now reset the balance and bring back calm. Have you always lived and farmed where you are now? No. My father bought the farm with his partner about 40 years ago, so I grew up on the farm. Um, I've always lived in the country mm -hmm. um, and was brought up on the farm, but we never lived on the farm. Right. Describe to me what it was when you were a lad and the way in which you saw it change? Um, when I was a lad, there was plenty of wildlife there. Plenty of birds of all various breeds and sizes and everything. And over the years, they've just disappeared. Right. Uh, and the whole point of the project is to bring them back. What kind of a, what range are you talking about here? Was it more than you could count? Was it, was it, a, was it a rich habitat oh, with but, birds, yeah. mammals? 40 years ago, yes. Insect. What about insect life? Because I always notice now when I drive in summertime, my memory of, of driving a car in summertime was that it would get splattered with insect life on the windscreen and on the... <laughs> and now that just doesn't happen at all. You know, and the, that drop-off, so is it... Is it down to the tiny as well that you're seeing disappear? Yeah, of course, yeah. Down to the insects, the, the flowers, the plants, everything. It's not just one thing. It's a whole ecosystem that's disappeared over time. And is that... Can I just ask, so is that more drainage and stuff going on where you are? Because it's marshland, isn't it? Well, and well, yeah. what's being grown or... And obviously we've had drought this year. That kills me. Not as bad as what was... What was the last really hot time? Was it 60... 67 or something? Well, 76 was the, was the famously warm summer b b up until yeah, modern times. Until but, but more so recently. It, rather than drainage, it was a, it was a drought that, that did for the, the hectares you're talking well, about. Like, this year's been particularly dry. Um, and the rains have actually started earlier than they did last year. So we've had a really, really dry summer. Everything's dried up. And then the rains have come a month earlier. So now we're really wet. But because the ground is so hot, it's so dry, Instead of sort of soaking it in, running it's sort of off. sitting on top awesome. and running off. Right. right. Um, it's a lot to do with loss of habitat. Um, a lot has happened around the area in the last 40 years. Um, the climate, the seasons have changed. So much of it. And so what is it that you can do then if you're up against nature in terms of your, your variation in climate, less rainfall, as well as m modern agricultural techniques that are around you? What have you realistically been able to do to, to reinstate what was? Right. Um, we got LIDAR information of all the fields that we're working on. Tell us about that, first of all. What LIDAR is um, basically a system where you can read all the levels that used to be, that are now and everything, and you can sort of work backwards from there. So we've got all the information, working with EPR and the RSPB, and we basically have, we're putting the land back to what it was 40 years ago. Obviously, 40 years, it's had cattle go over the land, it's had dust come in, various other aspects have changed the, the land. So I'm just basically scraping it all back and holding the water in, hopefully. Holding the water so in. So you can't... So you can't... I mean, obviously, you can't raise the water table, no. so you're trying to s seal in the water somehow. Yeah. What? So you're almost turning it into mini reservoirs to... Yeah. They're, 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 they're called scrapes. So we're, they've got reels. So you've got a reel that's a very shallow indent in a field. And over the years, they just flatten. Basically. A reel. A reel. A reel. A reel. So what okay. I'm basically doing is scraping the reels out so they so don't... So is a reel a ditch? Sort of, but it's not... It's a... Like, it'll only be, like, a foot deep. OK. 
where a ditch can be any depth. So all I'm really doing is going to the original reels and scraping them out to what they used to be. So when it rains, instead of the rain hitting sort of a narrow channel like that, it's going to be the same depth, but 20 foot wide. So instead of it running off, it will stay where it's got to be. How long have you been at this? How long a process of, of rehabilitation have you been involved with? The, the, the boots on the ground started September this year. Um, it's been four years in the planning with all the paperwork, Natural England, consultancies. We've had all the bird watchers from the RSPB do various bird watches every year to see the state of the birds. Um, we meant to start last year, but there was a delay with Natural England, because obviously we had all the COVID stuff. Um, but literally, we've been doing it since September this and, year. And are the animals back? Are they coming back? Yes, they are. Um, two weeks ago, we had our first big flock of lapwing. OK. That we've not had for a couple of years now, so... Yes, it is bringing them back. And what about the look? I mean, are you, are you able to look at it from above, for example? You know, can you see it as well, a bird's eye view and, and see the, the, the effect of, of, of reinstating what you're doing? Yes, I bought a drone. <laughs> so I put the drone up in the air and I can see everything, what's changing. I can see the birds come in. But obviously, if I drive around the farm, which I do every day anyway, you can see where all the birds are, are sitting down and feeding. What do the other farmers around you think of what you're doing? Are, um, you a, are you an island, an, an oasis of, of nature surrounded by big agri? Um, no, so we've got RSPB are sort of both sides of me. They've already started this project. So it's basically the whole North Kent, the marshes, we're, we're joining up the whole North Kent to do this project. The, the next land, landowner next to me is uh, Kent Wildfowl Association. They're also doing the project as well. I think they're starting in January, so they're doing it. So it should be the whole North Kent will be doing the project. And it, Can I, is, a, sorry. is a balance still being struck? I mean, are you still, are you still, are people still growing crops and raising livestock for food, as well as yeah. leaving breaks for nature to re-establish itself? Yeah. Can I ask a question? Just two things. Firstly, there used to be a thing called set aside. Is that, and I understood that had been phased out, where you would actually, you, it carried on even past, I thought, the end of the EU. Um, you would, farmers could get a certain amount of cash to not do, you know, certain hedgerows and whatever. But I thought that had got fa phased out and been replaced by something called habitat. But then I understood that had got phased out as well. So all I'm asking is, can you get... Is there any cash for farmers to give up their more productive land? Because that's a real concern for a lot of cash-strapped farmers, especially... You kind of but sheep you, farmers. You don't, you don't really want at a time of food insecurity. You don't really want to be exactly. surrendering productive land. And the second thing is, you know, I completely appreciate what you're doing. I'm sure all of us do, and lots of people will, and it's very exciting. And you're surrounded by bird sanctuaries and wildfowl trusts and all the rest of it. But there is a broader project of rewilding all over the shop. You read about this, and it's awful. It's doing terrible things. Quickly, what do you say to that, Alex? Is there a balance to be struck and is it being unbalanced? I, yeah, see, I'm one of the, the lucky ones because the ground I'm doing has... We've never put a plough in the ground to grow food. It's literally for the cattle, for cattle right. and sheep. The bonus of doing this is when the water stays in there, the grass will come back richer and greener. Yeah. So it's actually better for the cattle. Right. Mm. Um, where if you're growing crops, it is detrimental to growing crops because, obviously, mm. if you're growing crops, that's your main... So, um, living. So you do if you do it right, you end up with a win-win situation. Yeah, I'm in a in a lucky position that it's a win-win situation. Um, I'm not on the farming for the ploughing and the cropping side to to speak from that side, but the whole area that I'm doing, it's literally just covered with cattle and sheep most of the year round. Going to have to move on there, Alex. Alex Bates, farmer and uh, rewilder. Thank you so much for coming in this evening. Not a problem at all. Good to keep up with the project as it develops. After the break, we'll meet this week's Great Britain, a woman who encourages older people to use their experience to help others. See you in three more minutes. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online. 
across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Tomorrow on GB News, we'll bring you an exclusive interview with the former leader of the Liberal Democrats, Sir Vince Cable. He tells Gloria De Piero about his decision to cover up a stroke he had while being the leader of the party. Mr Cable also reflected on his time working alongside the Tories during the Liberal Democrat coalition under David Cameron. Here's a taste of what he had to say. Michael Gove has matured, I think, become quite an interesting politician, more open-minded. But at the time, was a you know a real clever dick. I always felt he had to score the last point in any conversation, and uh, always had to try and get his way. Uh, so yeah, they varied, but but you learnt to the, the the attitude I had to the Tories I worked with, particularly those in my department, was. You know, leave your weapons at the door because we've got a job to do. And, and by and large, they respected that. I'm fascinated by if there's any examples about Michael Gove being a clever dick. <laughs> <laughs> well, he always had to have the last word in any cabinet discussion. With and he, he was quite witty with it, but it, you know, you realise the <laughs> personality like, type. <laughs> yeah. You can watch the full interview with Sir Vince Cable on Gloria Meets from 6pm tomorrow. There will also be interviews with the Employment Minister Guy Opperman and the Shadow Minister for Skills and Further Education, Toby Perkins. OK, it's now time to meet this week's Great Britain. Our own modest recognition of the positive and hopeful impact that some people make on the world around them. Retired occupational therapist Rosemary Fletcher has been volunteering in various capacities for 35 years. Most recently, she has been encouraging senior people to follow her example and give of their time, and perhaps more importantly, their experience uh, for the communities of Stirling, Falkirk and Clackmannanshire. Rosemary joins me now from her home in Stirling, uh, and in the studio with me is Nick Walker, the Country Senior Director at Edwards Life Sciences. Uh, Rosemary, 
Are you there? Lovely to see you, Rosemary. Uh, she'd, yes. she'd say you're from you're from my you're from my town. Uh, we are yes, uh, we indeed. must, be, we Just, must uh, almost be neighbours. Be a mile or so away. <laughs> How did you become involved in all of this volunteering that you've been uh, doing, Rosemary? Well, many years ago, when I was a mother of a cub, I put my hand up to say yes, I would help at a cub camp that weekend, and I've been helping with the scouts ever since. And then since I retired, I've been um, volunteering with the Retired and Senior Volunteer Program, RSVP, in around Forth Valley and the NHS in Forth Valley. And why, it's almost, it's almost a rhetorical question, but why is it important, would you say, to involve the, the senior demographic of the population in volunteering, as well as, you know, we often hear about youngsters being uh, invited to get involved? Well, when people retire or become older, the day after we retire from work, we don't use, lose all our skills and experience. We still got these skills and experience and they're there to be used to help, continue to help the community and to benefit others, either younger people or <clears throat> our own age group, just to and use them, use your skills and experience. And it also means that um, people aren't getting isolated at home, that out and about they can do things. There's always going to be somewhere, somebody that you can volunteer for or with and help. What kind of activities uh, does your group RSVP Fourth Valley actually promote? What do you, what do you get the seniors uh, doing? So we've got four um, different groups. There's volunteers who are in NHS Fourth Valley and the different hospitals. We also have volunteer walk leaders who take people, mainly older people, on walks, different lengths and different um, complexity every week. We have knitting groups, people who can knit at home, bring the knitting in, which is then distributed far and wide, Africa, mm -hmm. Eastern Europe, the UK, Scotland, all sorts of places. And then um, we also have volunteers, older volunteers in schools, helping children read, just helping with other, anything that the teacher feels that and a volunteer can do to support young people. So it's a mixture Nick, of <clears throat> turning, where turning you to, want to find it. Turn, just turning to you, Nick, but it seems so <clears throat> obvious, really, in, in the best possible way, what Rosemary's saying, that we, sh we should, of course, be taking advantage of this of the senior element of the population because of all of that experience, because, because of all that wisdom. Yeah, exactly. And really the, the example that Rosemary's setting here, I mean, it, it, it's phenomenal. I mean, the, the amount of value she mentions there about the, the, the skills, the experience that she's able to pass down to the younger generations. And this is part of something that we're trying to, uh, an initiative called Unifying Generations, which is about exactly that, like Ro Rosemary's doing, using the experience she's gained from you know, running the scouts, but also uh, the, the work that she did during COVID, where you're bringing, again, people together across the generations. It's really powerful. And also, I hadn't actually thought about it until Rosemary said it's, of, it's so beneficial for those senior people, you know, because it prevents that isolation and that, I, I suppose that self-imposed redundancy that maybe people have after they stop working or, or whatever else. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and again, during COVID, I think there was a real example of that where there's um, a real kind of disconnect. Um, and actually, as part of the, uh, the initiative, we, we ran a survey of more than 2000 people across the UK as part of a wider European study. And actually showed that there was a large percentage of the over 65s that felt that they were quite disconnected during COVID. So the, the kind of initiatives that that Rosemary is doing, and again, bringing some of the, the, the people that she's been working with, with the scouts, the younger generations, to try and help across different initiatives. So things like um, interaction across technology, for example, or even creating uh, mentorship programs from where the older generation can pass down their skills, knowledge, and training to the younger generations. So that's why it's so important. And like you say, that really helps with the, 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 the isolation and some of the loneliness as well. Rosemary, next talking there about COVID, obviously, what was the, how did you feel when that happened? You know, as, as someone who was so involved, 
you know, so so busy, with, you know, with you know, with being involved with other people's lives in that way. What was it like when COVID and lockdowns descended on your world? I suppose I thought, help. What am I going to do now? Because we were all told to stay at home, particularly older people were told to stay at home. But just after we had to withdraw all the volunteers from the hospitals, I was asked if we could put in a meet and greet service at the local GP and minor injury centre. And that's what really, really kept me going during COVID um, because people came and volunteered, younger people, some older people, people on furlough from all walks of life, and they wanted to help the NHS and their experience of volunteering, uh, even for a short time, helped them and helped lots of other people, hundreds of people, in fact. Amazing. And they got me and through. Your, your, efforts, your efforts and your contribution to the community have been recognised at the highest level, let's say. Um, tell us about the, what, what happened in, in 2021, the New Year's honours. Yeah, so it was in early December 2020. I was just looking at my junk mail and I saw this thing that said NY21 honours and I thought, scam? <laughs> but it wasn't. Fortunately, I opened it and felt very humbled, very surprised that somebody had nominated me for volunteering in the NHS. So, yeah, that was, um, I say, a pleasant surprise and all down to, I'm the representative of a large body of volunteers who did a lot of work during COVID. And, and I, this is partly what I was awarded for, for the time I spent in the NHS. So I didn't get it presented till just a, a year later down at Windsor Castle. And it was um, the Princess Royal that presented me with the award. And it was very nice because in the health, I used to work in the health service and I was an occupational therapist. And Princess Anne is the patron of the College of Occupational Therapy. So that was a nice sort of touch that um, she presented me with the award. Rosemary, it's lovely talking to you. I wish I had longer to have a longer conversation with you, but you're, you're absolutely an example of, uh, you know, of the best of someone contributing, giving of yourself, giving of your time to the community. And it's been lovely to sh uh, just to share and spend a little bit of time with you. Thank you so much for this evening. And also thank you to you, Nick. No it's problem. just so inspiring to hear about that commitment that people can continue to make. And, you know, clearly being over 65 or whatever, those, those numbers are, uh, are largely irrelevant as far as I can see for those that have uh, gifts to draw upon and contributions to make. After the break, uh, at a tough time for the farming industry, I'll talk to a man who's selling Christmas trees to help make ends meet. See you shortly. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. 
I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Dolan tonight at the new early start time of 8 p.m. We kick off with the People's Hour, in which I'll be taking your video calls. After nine, my big opinion monologue and US news with the Queen of American Media, Kinsey Schofield, plus my all-star panel and tomorrow's papers. And in my take at 10, I'll be dealing with woke lunatics trying to cancel Christmas in the name of diversity. No one's pulling my cracker. That's Mark Dolan tonight on GB News. Welcome back once again to Neil Oliver Live. A 65 tonne tank that last saw service during the Cold War is being renovated ahead of King Charles coronation next year. A team of volunteers from the Royal Lancers and at Nottinghamshire Yeomanry Museum at Thorsby are scraping years of rust from the Conqueror tank in an effort to save the machine for future generations. Many of those fixing the tank are veterans who did similar jobs in the armed forces. The museum thinks it will cost around £10,000 to get it looking fresh from the factory. We sent Will Hollis to find out more. As restorations go, they don't get much bigger than this. This bin's particularly bad. As you can see, the whole thing's rotted away, so that's going to take a lot more work than the other one which has only got patchwork on it. At 65 tonnes, the Conqueror is quite the gate guardian at Thorsby. When the military museum in Nottinghamshire asked for volunteers to fix its new tank, it was an easy yes for army veteran Gus. I left in 93, and this is the first chance I've had to work on a tank again, and it's like coming home. It's really good. We're loving it, because all the lads, they all know what they're doing, and they've all got specific jobs. Um, and we just kind of help each other out to get the thing back up to scratch. The Conqueror is covered in rust and has more than a few holes to fill, which is where restoration expert Dave, who runs a paint business, takes lead. What we've got here are all the bazooka plates from the side of the tank, and they are basically the blast shields to prevent uh, them being uh, bazookas going and blowing the, tack the tracks off. I'm taking these away today to be restored at uh, our workshops in Retford. Surrey, the first public demonstration of Britain's new armoured giant, the mighty Conqueror, the 65-ton tank that packs a punch to match its size. The Conqueror is one of the biggest tanks ever used by the British Army. Only 180 or so were built. They were mainly used to defend West Germany during the Cold War. This one here, it's in desperate need of repair, and that's why it's been brought here to the Military Museum at Thorsby. The Lancers Museum honours the long service Nottinghamshire has given to the British Army, from the early days of light cavalry to the tank regiments that we see today. Bringing the Conqueror here helps to complete the museum which opened in 2011, but the connection Thorsby Park has with tanks goes back much further. We're not going to elevate that gun any time soon, are we? Former Lancer Captain Mick is the museum's curator. Thorsby in World War II used to have a tank training area. Uh, and this is the first tank to be back at Thorsby Courtyard 
in over 80 years. So I think that is a, a, a really good uh, advertisement for Thorsby. Most of the men here served in the 17th and 21st Lancers, including Rob. This year, the regiment celebrates the centenary of its formation. Rob says projects like this help veterans stay connected to their history and each other. When I was leaving school, I had a choice, either go down the pit in a factory or follow what my heart said, which was to be a soldier. We have a saying in the forces. You either come out of the forces as a civilian or you come out with half a green brain, which means that you've still got something there for the forces. The museum hopes that visitors will help to meet the £10,000 cost of fixing the tank so it can be ready for King Charles's coronation in May next year. And after that, the small piece of history will become a big part of this museum's future. Will Hollis for GB News in Thorsby. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Now, it being the run-up to Christmas and all, we were going to be talking there to a farmer who is growing Christmas trees by the thousand, I can only imagine, uh, as, a, as a diversification. Uh, but in that, in that way of technology, we aren't able to get our uh, connection to him at the moment. So, failing that, in the break, bear with me, we were talking about something else came up, that it's the 30th anniversary now of the first text message, that ubiquitous mode of communication uh, more reliable than links to uh, contributors on GB News as things turn out. Now, Kerry has just told me something, some amazing stats about the history of texts. Yeah, more, more erroneous facts. I think this is quite funny, actually. And at my age, in my 60s, to me, this is super weird. Uh, less so for Dominic, I'm sure. Dominique. <laughs> uh, Dominique, I'm sorry, Dominique. Um, nearly half of uh, Gen Zs, 46%, have been dumped by a text. Now, nearly half. I, I think that's just so rude. Only 4% of baby boomers have been dumped by a text. I'm a baby boomer. Um, uh, a quarter, 28% of millennials, have received a marriage proposal by text. That's blokes not even having the bottle Do to Dominic, get on the Dominic, knee. You, we, in the break, though, you were saying that you said... What did you say about the fact that most get dumped by text? That I don't know. I feel like the dumping over text thing, I, I think it depends on the context. Like, if you've been in a long-term relationship with someone, then obviously dumping them via text is, like, a weird thing to do. But if you've, like, been dating someone, like, casually, I don't really see... Or it's, like a casual sort of relationship. I don't see how ending that relationship via text is, is a bad thing because, like, I'm why horrified. would you want to wait, waste someone's time, bring them all the way out, out of the house just to say, like, because I'm done with you? Because I don't it's get human it. decency, isn't it, Kerry? Absolutely. I don't, right. I don't see how it is. Right, we're going, to have to, we're, going to have to get, we're going to have to get to the end of the show, sadly. I can tell you that that first text that was sent 30 years ago said, Merry, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. So how apt and how appropriate is that? Sadly, that's all from me on Neil Oliver Live for another week. My thanks to my panel, Kerry Dingle and Dominique Samuels, and to all of my guests. I'll be back at six o'clock next week uh, on Saturday. Next up on GB News, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Looking ahead to tomorrow's weather, and the UK will be generally cloudy with a keen easterly wind making it feel cold for all. Here are the details. Scotland will start the day on a chilly note with a scattering of showers. These will be most frequent in the east, but in between the showers there will be some sunshine. Skies across Northern Ireland will be cloudy with a few sunny spells. Most places staying dry all day, but the odd isolated shower is possible. The easterly wind will push showers across Northern England, very few of these making it to the west where it will stay rather cloudy. Cloudy skies across much of Wales, with the best chance for some sunny spells reserved for the west. Outside chances of a few showers in the east. These will be wintry over the hills. Dry but cloudy across the Midlands on Sunday. A few breaks in the cloud here and there, however, there's also the chance of the odd shower. It'll feel cold in the wind. In East Anglia, it'll be cloudy and mostly dry, but a keen northeasterly breeze will make it feel cold. The coasts will be particularly exposed to this, making it feel like low single figures. Southern England will start Sunday cloudy, however, a few sunny spells are possible in the west. A few showers will continue to feed westwards during the morning and into the afternoon. 
Heading towards lunchtime and showers will continue to feed westwards. Away from those showers, some bright spells but feeling cold. That's how the weather is shaping up during tomorrow morning. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by Headliners.